in the previous lecture we were discussing about DVS spectrum and we had seen that the response spectrum can be plotted in a tripartite plot and can be idealized as a series of straight lines representing all the three spectrums that is the displacement, velocity and acceleration spectrums. We continue with this response spectrum for different earthquakes that were recorded all over the world. For, those, for them the response spectrums were obtained and plotted in a tripartite plot and a similar exercise was uh, done to represent it by a series of straight lines. And it was seen that the most of the earthquakes represented uh, the same kind of pattern, only difference was uh, between the values of T A, T B, T C, T D, T E and T F uh, uh, that were obtained and they were different for different earthquakes. So, this observation led to uh, a general shape of the response spectrum for earthquake and therefore, that shape was utilized for constructing what is known as the design response spectrum. The design response spectrum obviously is the response spectrum that for, uh, using which we design all the structure for future earthquake. Now, a, an exercise was carried out uh, to show that the uh, different earthquake records uh, provide the same kind of idealized response spectrum on a tripartite plot. For Parkfield earthquake and for El Cento earthquake, these exercises uh, were carried out and one can see uh, that the idealized uh, response spectrum for the two earthquake, this is the El Centro earthquake and this was the Parkfield earthquake when they were idealized with the help of straight line, they nearly had the same kind of feature. And only thing that differed was the T, A, T values, T values at different points. And these T values were compared in this table. Uh, for the Parkfield earthquake and for the El Centro earthquake, one can see that T A value that uh, basically of was obtained for Parkfield and for the El Centro, it was 0 0.03 and this was 0 0.041. For Parkfield, it was 0 0.134, that is TB, and it was 0.125 for El Centro. For TC, it was 0 0.436 and 0 0.349 for the El Centro, and 4.12 was for uh, T D for Parkfield and for L Centro it was 3.135. T C uh, T E and T F uh, they um, were more or less the same for the two earthquakes, especially the T F. So thus uh, uh, the these two earthquake records revealed uh, that uh, there could be difference between the values of T A, T B, T C, T D, T E, T F, but the nature of the response spectrum can be approximated by a series of straight lines having the characteristics that we discussed before. Now, let us come to the design response spectrum. The design response spectrum is the response spectrum which is used for designing all the structures for future earthquakes which are known, not known. Uh, therefore, it is a difficult task what generally is done for uh, obtaining the quantities for future earthquake is that uh, we try to see the trend of the parameter that uh, we are looking for. Uh, of that parameter uh, in the previous earthquakes. Uh, 
So, therefore, uh, once we were convinced from the uh, results of the different response spectrums drawn on the tripartite plot that the, the shape of the response spectrum can be uh, idealized by a series of straight lines between uh, you know, T A, T B, T C, T D, T E, etc. Uh, we said that the future earthquake also will show up similar kind of trend and therefore design response spectrum was uh, developed on that basis. However, the design response spectrum should satisfy uh, some other requirements. For example, the spectrum should be as smooth as possible uh, and therefore, the idealizing the response spectrum by a series of straight line is quite rational. Uh, if the response spectrum or the design response spectrum is not smooth enough and uh, it changes rapidly with uh, time period, then uh, there could be a sudden change in the value of spectral acceleration for a small difference of time period. Now, it is quite expected that the time period of a structure in reality could be different than the time period that we theoretically calculate. Therefore, uh, if there is a large change in the uh, spectral uh, value or uh, the spectral acceleration for a small change in time period, then there could be a lot of difference between the theoretical spectral acceleration that is considered uh, in the design and the actual spectral acceleration that the uh, art, you know, structure uh, experiences at the time of earthquake. Uh, so, uh, in order to eliminate that, the design response spectrum uh, were are considered to be as smooth as possible. Then design uh, spectrum should be representative of spectra of past ground uh, motions that we uh, explained before. Next, uh, two response spectra should be considered uh, to cater to variations and design philosophy. Now, the design philosophy of the earthquake resistant design is that we design the structure for a design response spectrum and see that that structure can survive in the extreme earthquake condition. That is, there will not be a complete collapse of that structure in the severe earthquake, it can have a huge amount of damage. So, this is the current design philosophy and therefore, we have to have two level uh, response spectrum, one is the design response spectrum, other is the extreme response spectrum. And next is that the response spectrum should be normalized with respect to peak ground acceleration because if you are wanting to uh, provide uh, the or prescribe a design response spectrum that should be prescribed in the form of the shape, but the actual response spectrum would be obtained after we multiply that shape with the peak ground acceleration which may differ from place to place. Next, let us see how we can construct a design uh, spectrum. So, for that we follow certain states, steps. First, the expected peak ground acceleration values for design and maximum probable earthquakes are derived for the region. Then peak values of ground velocity and displacements are obtained using uh, this empirical relationship that is if any one of the quantities generate the ground acceleration uh, 
uh, maximum ground acceleration if it is given then with the help of that one can find out the peak ground displacement and peak ground velocity uh, using these uh, values of this constant c and uh, c1 and c2 as this so once we have the specified values of the maximum ground acceleration and from that once we have obtained the maximum ground displacement and maximum ground velocity then in a tripartite plot we can have a baseline plot, plot uh, in the four way log paper that means that baseline plot will simply uh, uh, draw uh, or, or show the uh, peak ground acceleration peak ground velocity and peak ground displacement then as we discussed before obtain the value obtain the bc d and cd segments using uh, these multipliers that is the uh, the maximum ground acceleration is multiplied by alpha a then maximum ground displacement is is multiplied by alpha d and maximum ground velocity is multiplied by alpha v these alpha a alpha d and alpha v they are available for different soil condition and also uh, for uh, the design earthquake level and the uh, extreme earthquake level uh, in, in various literature and they are obtained from the past earthquake records. Uh, since C and D points are fixed, uh, the TC is known and once TC is known then with respect to TC other values TA, TB, TD, T, TF etc can be obtained uh, from the uh, again the experience that people had at from the earth, uh, previous earthquake records. Now generally the this empirical relationship is used in obtaining the values of TB, TA, TE etc. For example, they are all defined in terms of TC and uh, TE and TF it has been seen that TF is generally in the uh, ranges uh, in, in this uh, uh, range that is 30 to 35 second and TE uh, generally ranges uh, between 10 to 15 second. So, now let us look at uh, how we can and uh, obtain using the steps uh, the response spectrum in a tripartite plot. This is the baseline, baseline means the ground maximum ground acceleration that is plotted over here and it is parallel to the SD axis and we uh, measure the acceleration along this line. Then this is the maximum ground displacement line which is parallel to acceleration line and the ground displace or the uh, ground displacement SD not ground displacement SD is measured along this line. So uh, this is the line showing the uh, maximum ground displacement this is a line showing the ground maximum acceleration and obviously uh, this is the line which shows the maximum ground velocity. So this is the baseline that we obtain. Then uh, as we have described before this segment that is from uh, C to B between B to C this segment basically is parallel to this line as we discussed before and they that that is equal to alpha a times the ground acceleration. So therefore we draw a line this line parallel to this line and uh, uh, by this this value being equal to alpha uh, a multiplied by u double dot x g. Similarly this line is parallel to this line and this is equal to alpha d times the maximum ground displacement. 
and this line is parallel to this line and this value is equal to alpha v times the maximum uh, ground velocity. So, once we have these lines plotted, then one can uh, join these lines to get the, uh, the uh, idealized response spectrum uh, des uh, described with the help of a series of straight lines. Now, if we wish to plot the spectral acceleration versus time period in a ordinary uh, paper, that means they are not log scale, but ordinary scale and normalize with respect to the uh, gravity that is G that S A by G plot can be shown to uh, be of this type. That means, this shape has emerged from the shape of the response spectrum that was observed in a tripartite plot. So, in almost all codes we find the spectral acceleration plot versus time uh, is of this particular shape. Now, uh, a design spectrum can be obtained for 50th percentile and 84.1 percentile in tripartite plot, 50th percentile means uh, the design spectrum and 84.1 percentile that, that is the mean value plus one standard deviation that gives a 84.1 percentile and that is taken as, as the response spectrum for the extreme earthquake. So, we can have these two earthquakes uh, uh, and for these earthquakes one can construct a design spectra given the following quantities. For example, the T A was given as 1 by 33 second, T B was 1 by 8 second, T E was 10 second and T A was 33 seconds. And uh, the alpha A, alpha D and alpha V values the this multiplying factors, they can be taken from a uh, standard uh, textbooks on earthquake engineering. For, for example, in this case alpha A was 2.17, alpha V was 1.65 and alpha D was 1.39 against uh, uh, the these values in the bracket they denote for the 84.1 percentile and this one for the 50th percentile and the damping was considered 5 percent. So, what we uh, did is that the, this ground acceleration, peak ground acceleration was given and with the help of that uh, we obtained the peak ground velocity and peak ground displacement using the empirical relationship that uh, we have, I have shown before. And uh, uh, then we plotted the two spectrum, this was the baseline that is showing the peak ground velocity, peak ground acceleration and peak ground displacement and then multiplying by alpha A, alpha D, alpha V values we obtain these segments of the straight line and join and obtain the uh, uh, response spectrum in a tripartite plot and the T A, T B, T C, T D, T E values were uh, specified. Therefore, once we have uh, the T A, T B, T C, T D, T E values specified and alpha A and alpha B and alpha D values are given, then one can construct a design spectrum. Uh, generally, uh, if uh, the T C value may be given and from the T C value one can obtain the other values that is T A, T B, etcetera using the approximate values that was given by uh, this relationship. Once you know this relationship, uh, approximate relationship one can obtain the values of T B and T A. T E and T F generally lie in this range. 
uh, we can uh, we have discussed uh, how one can obtain a design response spectrum uh, using uh, an idealized uh, segmented uh, or idealized uh, series of straight lines and plotted uh, in a tripartite plot. Uh, now we come to the different levels of earthquake that is described in the earthquake literature. Uh, design earthquake that generally specify certain value of peak ground acceleration and uh, from that peak ground acceleration one can also estimate the peak expected peak ground acceleration for the extreme earthquake. Now, in the literature we get uh, different and terminologies uh, for the design earthquake. For example, one is MCE that is maximum credible earthquake, there is a large largest earthquake that we expect from a source. Then SSE that is uh, safely shut down earthquake that is used in a nuclear power plant design. Other terms which denote similar levels are credible, safety level maximum, etcetera, and they denote the upper limits for the two level concept. That means, they denote the earthquake PGA values uh, for the extreme condition. The lower level that is the design uh, PGA value is called OBE that is the ordinary base earth, uh, uh, earthquake and other terminologies which are used or the similar terminology which are used for ordinary base earthquake is operating level probable design and strength level earthquakes. And generally uh, the OBE that is the design usual design uh, earthquake that is the OB uh, that is the ordinary base earth, earthquake is approximately equal to half of the safe shutdown earthquake uh, used in the nuclear power plant design. Next we come to the site specific spectra. The site specific spectra uh, is, is called a a site dependent response spectrum and uh, they are used for designing specialty structures uh, for a particular place and that particular place may have certain characteristics in terms of geology and geography. That is the design response spectrum that we talk of that design response spectrum may not be valid for that particular site because of the geological and uh, uh, geographical uh, conditions of the site. Now for that what we do is that we collect as many number of, of earthquake data uh, possible for that particular site that is in and around that site. Sometimes if the collected data is not sufficient, then we augment the earthquake data by collecting uh, the data for similar geographical and geological regions. Once we have collected enough number of earthquake records in and around that site after augmentation, uh, then uh, we uh, scale uh, the earthquake records and also modify it for the soil condition. Now the scaling is necessary uh, because uh, different earthquake records that have been collected, uh, they may be valid for uh, certain epicentral distances, uh, certain uh, peak ground acceleration or certain magnitude of earthquake. Whereas, the site specific spectrum uh, 
uh, that uh, may have to be constructed for a given epicentral distance, for a given magnitude of earthquake and for a given soil condition. Uh, therefore, all the uh, earthquake records that have been collected, they must be properly scaled uh, so that it reflects uh, the epicentral distance and the magnitude or the peak ground acceleration for which uh, the uh, site specific spectrum have to be constructed. And also uh, the um, site specific spectrum should be compatible with the soil condition. And um, in most of the cases, uh, the records that have been collected, uh, these records are collected uh, on certain particular uh, sites whose soil conditions uh, may not be same as the soil condition that is existing for the site. Uh, therefore, uh, certain techniques are uh, used uh, for uh, scaling and after the scaling, uh, we obtain the required response spectrum or site specific spectrum. The scaling depends upon the uh, data that are available. Uh, in fact, if the data are given uh, in, in the form of uh, the time history records, then these time history records are Fourier synthesized and then the frequency contents of the uh, ground motion of uh, the each uh, record, uh, they are normalized to provide a common base or common magnitude of earthquake uh, for which the site specific spectrum is to be constructed. Uh, also, uh, it is uh, normalized uh, so that epicentral distance of uh, the uh, particular uh, site for which you are constructing the site specific spectrum, uh, that epicentral distance is also reflected in the scaling process. After uh, the response uh, or, or the earthquake records have been scaled properly, uh, then uh, and modified for the local soil condition, then a response spectrum corresponding to each one of those uh, modified uh, uh, records of the ground motions uh, are uh, considered for obtaining the response spectrum from each one of them. And these response spectrums are then uh, averaged and smoothened uh, in order to obtain the site specific spectrum. The effect of appropriate soil condition uh, generally is incorporated by uh, deconvolution and convolution as uh, shown in uh, this figure. Uh, in, in most of the cases, uh, the ground records that are available, uh, they may be on the surface uh, of a particular uh, uh, ground and that ground may be having a particular soil property. And uh, the soil property that is existing uh, for the site is uh, say uh, different that is at point E. Uh, say for example, uh, we are interested in obtaining the site specific spectrum and uh, say at point A, uh, we have the uh, uh, some uh, ground uh, record that is available. Then in order to uh, uh, get the appropriate soil condition uh, in the site specific spectrum, uh, we uh, do a deconvolution. Uh, that is uh, from the uh, ground recorded ground motion at station A, uh, we uh, obtain uh, the um, ground motion at the bad bedrock by a deconvolution process. And once we get the bedrock motion and then uh, we assume that the bedrock motion that is available at point D, uh, that will be same as that which is uh, available uh, at uh, point B and uh, assuming these uh, uh, two ground uh, bedrock motions to be same, uh, then we uh, uh, do a uh, 
forward wave propagation problem or carry out a forward propagation problem at point D uh, to point T and uh, um, consider the appropriate soil condition while uh, performing uh, these uh, convolution technique. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, 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 explained uh, with the help of a, a particular uh, problem um, here uh, in place of the uh, ground uh, time history records. Uh, we consider uh, that there is a site over here and uh, there are three stations uh, where basically the data uh, have been collected and at these uh, three stations uh, the epicentral distance uh, is given and the shear wave velocities are given. These shear wave velocities and epicentral distances um, are different for the three stations. Uh, the shear wave velocity which is given uh, basically indicates the uh, soil condition uh, for uh, the particular station. Now, uh, in, in, in place of uh, the uh, ground uh, history or time history of ground motion uh, for these stations, uh, it is uh, given in the form of the power spectral density function. Uh, of the ground motion or power, power spectral density function of the ground acceleration for these three stations. Uh, with the help of that uh, information and uh, the uh, particular attenuation law that is valid for the region, uh, we uh, perform uh, the uh, calculations in order to obtain the site specific spectrum at this particular site and in the in that process uh, we will see how we can uh, do the scaling for uh, the uh, magnitude of peak ground acceleration and also do the scaling for the epicentral distance and finally, uh, consider the appropriate soil condition that is existing at the site. Uh, the, uh, the basis of the problem uh, will be uh, much more clear uh, when uh, we will uh, cover the spectral analysis technique uh, for uh, solving a, a structure's response uh, to random ground motion. Uh, but for the time being, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the problem is explained uh, with the help of uh, the uh, uh, some accept, ex, ac, uh, accepted formula uh, uh, in order to show you how the uh, scaling is done. Uh, now, for the, the site 1, the power spectral density function of the ground acceleration uh, is uh, given by this. For site 2, uh, the, uh, this is the power spectral density function of the ground acceleration which is shown and this is for the site 3 the power spectral density function which is given. Now, these power spectral density functions are uh, available uh, for the uh, surface of the ground and as I told you if we have uh, the information available on the surface of the ground. Uh, then many a time we have to do a deconvolution technique uh, to obtain the corresponding quantity at the rock bed level and uh, uh, then, then only uh, we take that uh, particular rock bed level information uh, and uh, we assume that the same uh, condition exists at the rock bed uh, of the particular site. Uh, so, what we do we first convert this power spectral density function which is given at the surface at each site uh, to the corresponding uh, power spectral density function which will exist at the uh, rock bed level just below site 1, site 2 and site 3. And for that uh, we use uh, uh, this uh, particular formula uh, which uh, will be uh, discussed uh, in the uh, uh, 
in, in chapter 4 where we will be discussing uh, the uh, response analysis of structures uh, for random ground motion. And uh, uh, there uh, we will show that uh, the if the power spectral density function uh, is given for a particular system then uh, and if it is an input to that particular system then output power spectral density function can be obtained uh, by multiplying the power given power spectral density function with the transfer function square of the system. So, here uh, the power spectral density function uh, at the surface uh, that basically is obtained uh, as a function of the product of power spectral density function at the rock bed multiplied by the transfer function square that is a, a forward um, problem or in other words forward wave propagation problem uh, that is from the rock bed we are going uh, to the surface. Now, uh, if this uh, equation holds good then from this equation we can work back what is the power spectral density function at the rock bed that will be equal to power spectral density function at the surface divided by the transfer function square and the transfer function square is given in terms of the depth of the soil and the shear wave velocity and the uh, damping of the system and this is obtained for uh, different frequencies. Now, using uh, these transfer function uh, uh, square uh, uh, for the specified values of the V s for the three sites for the three sites we have seen that we have different shear wave velocities and the uh, uh, soil layer depth is given as 20 meter, uh, xi is taken as um, 5 percent and then for each omega value we, we calculated the values of transfer function square and we divided the surface uh, um, uh, power spectral density function of acceleration by the transfer function square. Uh, that gave us the uh, power spectral density function of the uh, ground acceleration uh, at the rock bed level just below site 1. Uh, similarly, uh, the uh, value of the um, um, power spectral density function at the rock bed level for site 2 is given over here and uh, the power spectral density function of the ground acceleration at the rock bed level at site 3 uh, is shown over here. So, once we uh, got this power spectral density function uh, then uh, there are uh, certain method uh, to calculate the peak ground acceleration uh, for the site at the rock bed level from the rock bed power spectral density function. Similarly, for uh, the site 2 we can find out the peak ground acceleration at the rock bed level from the power spectral density function of the ground acceleration that we have obtained at the rock bed level. And for uh, site uh, 3 also we did the uh, same kind of calculation in order to obtain the peak ground acceleration uh, at the rock bed level from the power spectral density function uh, that is uh, obtained for the site 3. Now, once we know the peak ground accelerations for the uh, three sites at the rock bed level and uh, we uh, use their epicentral distance. Uh, then using the epicentral distance and the peak ground acceleration one can calculate the magnitudes of earthquake uh, for which these power spectral density functions were obtained for the uh, sites 1, 2 and 3 at the surface level. Uh, so, uh, these magnitudes of the um, uh, three sites uh, for which the ground motion uh, 
or uh, the ground motion power spectral density functions were available are now calculated uh, that is m1 is equal to 6.2 m2 was found to be 5.8 and m3 was found to be 7.3 so uh, these magnitudes are obtained by using a attenuation relationship given by toro and uh, if you recall uh, most of the attenuation relationship they provide a peak ground acceleration as a function of the magnitude of earthquake and epicentral distance. Therefore, if peak ground acceleration is given and epicentral distance is given, then from that formula one can find out the magnitudes of the earthquake. Now, uh, it is uh, specified that the for the site, uh, the site specific spectrum should correspond to a, a uh, magnitude of earthquake which is equal to 7. Uh, therefore, uh, all the power spectral density functions which were obtained at the rock bed level for site 1, site 2 and site 3 uh, must be uh, scaled uh, for the magnitude of earthquake that is uh, the magnitude levels uh, should be brought to the level of 7. Uh, so, for that what is done is again we go back to the attenuation relationship and in that relationship we put uh, the value of the magnitude at 7 and epicentral distance as the epicentral distance of the site uh, which is specified. So, once we uh, provide these two information from there we get the peak ground acceleration. Uh, which should exist at the rock bed level and for the uh, site for which we are wanting to uh, have the site specific spectrum. So, once we know that peak ground acceleration uh, of the site, uh, then one can obtain uh, the scaled power spectral density function at the rock bed level. Uh, is equal to the peak ground acceleration square of the site and the peak ground acceleration square of the uh, different uh, locations uh, that is location 1, 2 and 3 for which he obtained the magnitudes of earthquakes at m1, m2, m3. Uh, for those uh, uh, locations the peak ground accelerations have already been calculated before. So, we know those peak ground acceleration. So, we modify the PSDFs of the uh, ground acceleration at the rock bed level of the three locations uh, in this particular way. Uh, this is the uh, unmodified that is the uh, peak uh, the power spectral density function of the ground acceleration uh, at any particular location say location 1 at the rock bed level and that is uh, now uh, multiplied by uh, PGA square S that is uh, PGA that we obtain for the site for which you are wanting to draw the site specific spectrum and peak ground acceleration for that particular location. Similarly, uh, for location 2 and 3, uh, we can get a power spectral density function, modified power spectral density function, uh, which will be valid at for that particular site in question at the rock bed level. Thus, uh, uh, we will get three scaled power spectral density function at the rock bed level of the site in question for which you are going to obtain the site specific spectrum. So, this scaling uh, takes care of the uh, scaling of magnitude uh, or the peak ground acceleration also uh, take care of the scaling uh, of the epicentral distance. So, after we have done that uh, then uh, we consider the soil condition and for the particular site uh, in question. So, the power spectral density function which you have obtained uh, at the particular site uh, coming from location 1 
that we call as PSDF1 and uh, if we multiply that by the transfer function square, uh, then uh, this uh, will provide us a power spectral density function at the surface level. So, this is the power spectral density function that we have obtained at the rock bed level coming from location 1 after scaling. And this will be the power spectral density function at the surface uh, of the ground that is at the site itself. So, that way one can obtain the power spectral density function and for uh, coming from location 2 uh, to the site and similarly one can construct uh, PSDF 3 uh, that will be coming from the location 3 uh, uh, which will be considering um, for obtaining the site specific spectrum uh, here. Now, once we get these uh, three power spectral density functions at the site, uh, then we generate the time histories of the ground motion or synthetically generate the power uh, time history of ground motion uh, from the given power spectral density function. And there are uh, techniques uh, for the uh, for obtaining uh, the synthetic uh, ground motion or generate synthetic ground motion for a given power spectral density function. So, utilizing that uh, one can uh, obtain the uh, power spectral uh, or the, obtain the uh, time histories of the ground motion uh, for the three PSDFs or in other words we get three time histories of ground motions from these three time histories of ground motion, uh, we obtain uh, the response spectrum, three response spectrums and uh, these three response spectrums are average and smoothened in order to obtain the final uh, response spectrum which is the site specific spectrum and which is shown here uh, in the last figure. Uh, so, this last figure shows the site specific spectrum. Uh, which is an averaged and smooth uh, uh, spectrum coming from the three earthquake records that have been synthetically generated. And so, uh, uh, the, uh, the procedure that you adopt depends upon the uh, given quantity uh, that we have uh, and if the given quantity is a, a quantity uh, which is uh, uh, only the time histories, then these time histories are to be scaled for the peak ground acceleration or magnitude of earthquake and uh, uh, epicentral distance through Fourier series analysis. If it is given in terms of the power spectral density function, uh, then the procedure that I have mentioned that can be obtained in order to you know, get the site specific spectrum. Uh, next, we come to uniform hazard spectrum. Uh, the uniform hazard spectrum uh, is also used uh, in many cases uh, when we are calculating uh, the hazard analysis uh, that is uh, seismic risk analysis of uh, structures um, at a particular uh, site and uh, uh, that may require uh, the construction of a uniform hazard spectrum. Uh, statistical analysis of available spectrum is performed to find distribution of peak ground acceleration and spectral ordinate at each period in order to obtain the uniform hazard spectrum. Uh, so, what is done is that if we have a, a number of uh, the response spectrums which are available uh, at a particular region, uh, then what we do is that uh, the peak ground accelerations which we get from each one of these uh, response spectrums, these peak ground accelerations are taken and a uh, uh, PDF and CDF that is cumulative distribution function and the probability density function of the peak ground acceleration is obtained uh, from the given data. Similarly, uh, for uh, a particular uh, ordinate of the response spectrum at a given time period uh, 
that is taken as a random variable and if we have got say 50 response spectrums available for the site then we get for a particular time period uh, 50 values of the uh, ordinate of the response spectrum. So, we construct again a power spectrum uh, probability density function and the CDF for that particular um, uh, ordinate of the spectrum at a particular time period. The same thing can be done for all the time periods and we can have a uh, distribution curve uh, for a number of time periods uh, and uh, a pi peak ground acceleration. And once we uh, get uh, these uh, power, uh, probability density functions uh, or the CDF cumulative distribution function, then from these uh, distributions the values of the spectral ordinates with specified probability of exceedance are used to construct the uniform hazard spectrum. Alternatively, uh, one can obtain a seismic hazard analysis uh, 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 which can be carried out for spectral ordinates. Uh, we have explained uh, the calculation of the seismic uh, hazard uh, curve uh, for the peak ground acceleration. Uh, so, the same concept uh, can be extended uh, for the spectral ordinates at each time period uh, for a given value of j. And uh, once we have uh, these uh, hazard curve for the spectral ordinate at a particular time period, uh, then uh, from that hazard curve again one can get uh, the uh, spectral ordinate corresponding to a certain probability of accidents and with the help of that data one can construct the uniform hazard spectrum. Uh, next we uh, come to the synthetic accelerograms. Uh, for many cases uh, one may have to obtain response spectrum or power spectral density function which are compatible uh, 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 with uh, the uh, time history records or uh, um, for a given response spectrum or a given power spectral density function one may have to calculate synthetically uh, a, uh, a compatible time history record. Uh, so, uh, these time history records which are generated from the response spectrum or given response spectrum or given power spectral density function, uh, these uh, time history records uh, uh, if they are used for constructing back the response spectrum or power spectral density function, they will be same as the ones from which they were generated. And uh, these compatible time history records are many a time uh, required for performing nonlinear analysis of structures uh, for a specified response spectrum or a specified power spectral density function. And as all of we know that the response spectral method of analysis and power spectral density function uh, method of analysis, uh, they are valid for the linear uh, case. Uh, therefore, if one has to perform a nonlinear analysis, then one has to obtain the compatible time history records. Now, respo uh, response spectrum compatible ground motion uh, is generated by iteration to match a specified spectrum. Uh, say it is first is, uh, it starts uh, with uh, the generation of a set of Gaussian run random numbers and a a set of iterations are performed and these iterations uh, are performed uh, in such a way uh, that at every iteration uh, the calculated uh, response spectrum is matched with the target response spectrum. Uh, now, in the case uh, of the uh, power spectral density function. Uh, 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 we obtain the compatible time history of ground uh, motion uh, by using uh, equation 2.39 uh, which is uh, nothing but uh, the concept that we have uh, uh, explained for the case of the Fourier series uh, 
and you can see here the any arbitrary function t can be written in the form of a Fourier series. Only difference over here is the values of phi i that is added now uh, and a i that is to be obtained. So, a i basically can be obtained uh, from uh, the relationship that exists uh, between C n and uh, the uh, ordinate of the power spectral density function multiplied by d omega. If you recall, uh, we obtained uh, the power spectral density function from the Fourier spectrum uh, in one particular problem and there we have just seen that how C n is related to s into d omega. So, uh, once we know the um, ordinate of the power spectral density function, uh, then one can find out the value of C n and that C n is nothing but the A i values. The phi i values uh, are some random phase angles which is uniformly uh, distributed between 0 to 2, 2 pi and we have got now many standard programs which can perform uh, this that is they can generate uh, the random uh, uh, angle which is uniformly distributed uh, between 0 to 2 pi. So, utilizing that one can generate a uh, time history of ground acceleration or ground motion uh, for a given power spectral density function. Many standard programs are these available are, are these days available in order to uh, obtain the uh, time history of ground motion which are compatible uh, uh, with the power spectral density function or a given response spectrum. Uh, generation of the partially correlated ground motion at a number of points having the same PSDF is somewhat involved. Uh, and uh, however, uh, the methodology is uh, given uh, in the reference 6 of the book. Mm -hmm.